Hi, I'm Sharon Croft Caro with It's All About Me. And the ME in me is not all about me. It's all about ministry equipping. Ephesians chapter 4 tells us that apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers, those are the leaders of the church, have the responsibility of equipping the saints, that's you and me, everyday Christians, for the work of the ministry. Um, one of the most important things that a Christian can do is share their faith in Christ. It's one of the most important things because Jesus Christ commanded it in the Great Commission. He said, "I, because I've got authority, I'm telling you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every tongue, tribe, and nation. Go therefore into all the world, preach the gospel to everybody, and teach them to do the things that I've commanded you. So he wanted um, the first Christians and every Christian after that, because we've got the Bible, we have his words in writing, we know what he said. So it's as if he said it to us personally. He said the most important thing that we can do, you know, we're all commanded to preach the gospel. Um, at different stages in life, we're going to do that differently. Um, I was a stay-at-home parent for a very long time, and I shared the gospel with my kids and taught them the Word of God on a daily basis. Um, and that didn't um, have the hoopla, you know. It didn't have the attention of some of the other ways that I've shared the gospel it was no less important than sharing the gospel with people from other nations, with cross-cultural groups that are traditionally opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's no less important. Whatever stage of life you're in right now, you have the ability and the responsibility to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the people around you. Now, today, I would like to share with you what I consider to be the most important lesson in evangelism. I think if people understand this one thing, this most important lesson in evangelism, that um, people will not be so reluctant to share the gospel. The most important lesson in evangelism is the gospel is good news. The gospel is good news. We don't need to get into a bunch of stuff about hell and hellfire and damnation and punishment um, and, you know, a lot of, of negative stuff, a lot of consequence, the consequences of people's actions. That stuff is real and um, there may be a point in time when you need to speak with people on those topics, but initially what you're sharing with people is the good news. You know, when the angels came to announce the birth of Jesus, they said, peace on earth, good will towards men. God's will towards people is good. God's intentions are good. His intentions are peaceful. And the writings of John, John says, God is love. Love is the very nature of who God is. So when we share the gospel, we are sharing good news. Let me express some of this news to us to you. Um, in the book of Revelation, um, chapter 5, verse 9 and 10, we have the lyrics of a song that it appears maybe the angels or some saints are singing to and about Jesus. And the song goes like this. Worthy are you to take the book and break its seals, for you were slain, that's Jesus was slain, and purchased with your blood people from every tongue, tribe, and nation, that means every people group, every language group, you have made them to be a kingdom of priests for our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So when Jesus died on the cross, it was to save us from our sin, and that's fantastic, and I really appreciate that. But he had more in mind than just giving us a ticket out of hell. His intention was that we rule and reign with Jesus Christ. 
and if you continue to watch these videos that I do, you're going to um, hear more about that, or perhaps you can go on BibleGateway.com and look up rule and reign, do a search on this yourself, and learn more about ruling and reigning with Christ. But when we invite people to the gospel, we are inviting these people, not just for a ticket out of hell, we are inviting them to rule and reign with Christ. And that's what we need to put the focus on. It's like if I'm inviting someone to a wedding, I don't say, and by the way, don't jump in the sewer because I'm inviting them to the wedding. I want to put the focus on the wedding, not on the bad stuff. I want to focus on the good things. I want to focus on the reward that God has for people. If we look at, at um, Hebrews um, chapter 6, verse 11, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God because the one who comes to God must believe that he is that means you've got to believe that God exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him we need to focus on the fact that God rewards people if we look let me see at at Revelation 22 verse 12 Jesus said behold I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to render to every man, and that means every person, according to what he or she has done. Jesus Christ is coming with the reward. And the reward that he's coming with is not just to take it out of hell. The reward is that we get to rule and reign with Christ. And so that knowledge of People from every tongue, tribe, and nation have been purchased with, by the blood of Jesus so they can have the privilege of ruling and reigning with Christ. That knowledge changes the way that I look at people. It changes the way that I treat people. Um, let, let me give you an example. When I look at people, I look at them through the eyes of the future. Um, when I was a poll manager working, you know, where people come to vote, you know, I would have people lined up in front of me, people from all walks of life, you know, some very wealthy, some very poor, people dressed differently, um, very distinct from one another. But as each person came in, I could see these people, each one of them, through the eyes of faith, see them in their future state, see them dressed in custom-made, royal robes of righteousness and the different um, aspects of their personality brought out um, like so their their very best features of their personality were being highlighted um, so i could like literally see into you know how god was going to use this person in the future to rule and reign with him um, let me give you an example, my, my grandfather um, was a lieutenant colonel in the infantry. And um, one night I had a dream about him with Jesus discussing the battle plans for the apocalypse. Now, because my grandfather was um, a great warrior, an infantryman, um, military strategy was part of his life. That's part of how God used him. And I could see that in the future, God is going to be using my grandfather and other famous generals, other famous military people to work out the battle plan strategy with him. Um, my son's girlfriend is a vet tech and I can see um, into the future for her, when she's ruling and reigning with Christ, her um, profession, what she's doing for Jesus is um, probably going to be working with the animals, helping the lion to remember that he's not going to, that he's not supposed to eat that lamb. You know, her specialty is cats. So when you look at people, um, you can see them as their future selves, as what they are going to be in the future 
when they're with Jesus. Um, whether somebody's a drug addict or a homeless person or a senator or a general or a housewife or an engineer or a banker, you know, no matter what this person is, um, no matter who you're looking at, Jesus has purchased these people. He paid the price for the lives of these people so they can rule and reign with him. The gospel is good news. What we're inviting people to do, when we invite people to the gospel, we are inviting them to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. So we're telling them the good news. We're inviting people to something good. If you look at um, Matthew chapter 28, when Jesus gives the Great Commission, you know, what he says there is, you know, all authority is given to him. So he wants it. So he's commissioning us to go out into all the world and preach the good news to all nations. And he says, and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them all that I've commanded you. Now, what Jesus wants us to teach is the kingdom principles. If you look at like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you know, there's so many times when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God is like this, the kingdom of God is like that, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. Um, and he talks about how the people in his kingdom behave. So we're not we don't necessarily have to teach people a bunch of negative, a bunch of do's and don'ts. I have a, a friend who said that in her denomination, what she learned as a teenager is don't dance, don't smoke, don't drink, and don't listen to, to rock and roll. And so she had this list of don'ts, which is fine. It's fine that you know you have a standard and there are certain things that you don't participate in, but you can not do all the don'ts and never do the do's. You know, I think that if you are sharing your faith, if you're doing what Mark 16 versus, I think it's like chapter seven, verse 17, 18 say, um, these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. In my name, they'll speak in tongues, they'll cast out demons, they'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. So if you're doing the stuff that you're supposed to do, you really don't have time for the stuff that you're not supposed to do. So when we're training people in righteousness, you know, we don't need to worry about saying, okay, don't drink, don't get, don't, don't get a tattoo, don't do this, don't do that, because we're teaching them what they're supposed to do. If you have, if you spend your time doing what you're supposed to do, you won't have time for the stuff that you're not supposed to do. It's just generally the way that it works. And what I found when I'm sharing the gospel with people, I don't necessarily have to share the entire thing. It's not necessarily my goal to get someone to say the sinner's prayer, which by the way, the sinner's prayer it's a great prayer, but it's not even in the Bible. So there are probably people who are gonna be in heaven who said that in their heart, but have never really voiced a sinner's prayer, but they have believed with their heart and they have confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord. And they are going to be saved, but they didn't necessarily follow the formula that some of us hear about. But um, it's not necessarily my goal to get someone to say the sinner's prayer. What my goal in sharing the gospel is, is to give a person enough information to take the next step in their walk of faith. And in most cases, that information can come across in anywhere between three and six words. Actually, it's anywhere between three and 10 words, sorry, miscounted. The three words are, Jesus loves you. 
and the next words are, may I tell you more about it? And that person has the freedom to say yes or the freedom to say no. And if they say no, you know, I don't need to go any further. If they say yes, you know, that conversation of me telling this person more about the love of Jesus could happen in five minutes. It could happen over several months. It could happen over several years. Um, we're not trying to get people to make an emotional um, flash in the pan, sudden kind of decision. We're giving them enough information to take the next step of faith. And with that information, they can make a decision. Let me give you an example of um, all of this coming together. Um, one night I was um, shopping at one of the um, of the multi stores that has you know some of everything. It's kind of late at night, and there was um, a group of teenagers that passed me, and um, they were dressed kind of in goth, and um, there was a young lady who just had the countenance of having like very low self esteem. And um, she looked kind of unkempt as if she really didn't care for herself and as if these other people in the group were, um, were kind of maybe telling her what to do or dominating her. And she was maybe, um, she had the countenance as if she did not have a voice in, in what she was doing. And when I saw this young lady, I saw her in the future. I, with eyes of faith, envisioned this young lady with confidence, with dignity, dressed in royal robes of righteousness. And as she passed me, I made eye contact and I said, Jesus loves you. And she kept on walking but she looked back and she said, what? I said, Jesus loves you. And there was this spark that came into her eyes because she had been told that someone loves her. Now, did she come back and start a conversation with me? No. Did I chase her down? No. That would have kind of put her in an awkward situation with the friends who, um, were maybe trying to dominate her, but there was now a, um, an opening in her mind. It's like the pump had been primed with just a little bit of water. So her way of thinking had changed just a little bit. So like that night, maybe in her, um, in her private time, maybe she was able to pray. She was falling asleep after smoking that last joint or doing whatever she had done that night. Maybe she was able to ask God, God, if you're real, can you tell me about this Jesus? You know, we all today have smartphones. When she was alone, she could have easily done a web search on Jesus loves me to find out more about exactly what that means. So by believing God rewards those who diligently seek him, believing that it's God's destiny, it's God's plan for people to rule and, and reign with Jesus. I was able to see this young lady who had no confidence, it looked like no will of her own, um, no self-care. I was able to see her with the eyes of faith, with the eyes of the future, dressed in royal robes of righteousness and based on that i was able to tell her how jesus christ feels about her i said jesus loves you and that message those three words were enough information for her to change her thinking and then take that information to the next step I didn't have to go into any information. 
um, about health. I didn't have to talk about a list of things not to do. I just shared the basic message. Jesus loves you. When you share that message with people, they have enough information, especially in the communication age, especially in the computer age. When you say, Jesus loves you, and you treat people as if they are the royalty that they will be in the future when they are ruling and reigning with Christ, then you change the way they think of themselves. You change the way that you think of them. You change the way that you treat them. And when you treat people like royalty, some of them will eventually begin acting like the royalty that they are. And that's the goal, that people rule and reign with Christ. So in this first lesson on teaching the gospel, we've learned the most important thing is number one, the gospel is good news. The gospel is good news. God rewards those who diligently seek him. That reward is that we get to rule and reign with Christ. That information changes the way that we view people. And all that it takes is a three word message to change the way people view themselves and give them enough information to make the next decision, to take the next step. That message is, Jesus loves you. That's all you have to say. Now for the next video, I have two choices in mind. Um, you can tell me what you think. We can either have a discussion of hell, eternal punishment, or we could um, maybe have a discussion on the first evangelist. Um, either one of the top of those topics is fine with me. So the people that watch this can let me know what they think and then we'll take it from there. Um, if any of you feel that you need um, more information about me, maybe more information on my bio, what, what makes me think I have the authority to, you know, tell people how to witness or whatever, um, you can just contact me personally, send me a Facebook message, um, Sharon E. Croft Caro, and um, I'll just get that message and respond to any questions um, that you might have. As I feel appropriate, I'll just give you the information that you need to make a decision. Um, thank you so much for watching, and please, the gospel is good news. Tell people that Jesus loves them.